God is a specialist in repairing broken things and restoring broken lives. And uh, for those of you that think Humpty Dumpty cannot be put back together again, or you don't think you have what it takes to reconstruct broken lives, there is a book in the Bible that I hope will make you think twice about that, and that is the book of Nehemiah. We're going to study the book of Nehemiah, and he's and there's a great book I encourage you to get. It's simply this title, Nehemiah, by, it is by Stephen Davy. And he's a great author, and he's a pastor in North Carolina. But he tells us about the value of Nehemiah as a person. And there's several qualities I wanted to highlight about him. He was compassionate. He was moved constantly when a message came from God. Secondly, he prayed persistently. In his little book, there are 11 prayers of his that are recorded. He knew the Old Testament scriptures well. He had a definite goal for God's glory to be revealed. And he depended on God to open doors of opportunity. And he always sized up the, the, work, the job before he started the work. And he knew how to delegate responsibility. He refused to be stopped by external opposition. He knew how to settle differences between people. He was a man of keen discernment. He didn't let personal criticism slow him down. He had respect for authority. He gave God the credit for the accomplishments. And he was willing to suffer injustice for God's work. And he always stayed focused on the goal. He did not succumb to the dangers, the risk, the obstacles, or the hardships that stood in his way. And he had moral strength and courage when everyone else around him did not. Which does beg the question for all of us, are we moved when we hear God's message? And how well do we know the Bible? Because it will change you. Do we depend on God to open up doors of opportunity? And with our work, whether it's secular, sacred, or whatever, do you, do you size up the job? Do you see that it can get done? And who needs to do it? And furthermore, are you able to settle differences between people? Or are you one that starts disputes? <laughs> Big difference. And definitely, lacking many ways today, he had a respect for authority. And he was willing to suffer injustice, and for him, all that mattered was that God would get the credit. And so this is a very, very important book. And I want us to take a closer look at it now and see how indeed God can repair broken things in your life. He can heal your diseases. He can get you in the right direction again. So let's go back to the book of Nehemiah. And it is in the middle of your Bible if you want to go there. And as you're turning to the book of Nehemiah, I'm quoting Stephen Davy again. He, said, or Covey, he says, It reveals what God can do with a person who yields his life to the will of the Father, doesn't have to get the credit, and gives all the glory to God. And the book of Nehemiah removes all excuses that we offer for our own inabilities or inadequacies. So the message is very loud and clear in the book of Nehemiah, if you are available, God will use you because there's, you're a one of a kind. You're a special creation. That means you have special abilities and gifts that only God gave you. That means you are loved. And if you're a believer, that means you are forgiven. Those are three things you ought to, you are special. You ought to, by the way, take your, take your outline and just jot extra notes down. So you got a lot of, hope you got some space, but take your, your outline out. I'll give the, the fill-ins at the end, but fill in some more things as you desire. And this is extra, but it is from the book. You, as a believer, are special. Write that down. Secondly, you are loved and you are forgiven. Those are great reassurances that we need. You're special, you are loved, and you are forgiven. So, and we, you know, as he, Stephen says, it is time, it is right for a reformer like Nehemiah because burn gates are commonplace. There are demolished lives and wounded people everywhere. Values are shattered, morals are corroded. Every generation needs people who are willing to restore and rebuild broken and bruised people. So that's indeed who Nehemiah was, but that's who you and I can be too. Let's go to the beginning of the book and a couple of things I do want to point out before I read. And that is, we already been through the book of Ezra. Nehemiah and Ezra were very close friends. 
And Nehemiah was a layman. Ezra was a priest. In the book of Ezra, the emphasis is on the rebuilding of the temple. In Nehemiah, the emphasis is on the rebuilding of the walls in Jerusalem. In Ezra, we have the religious aspect of the return of the people. In Nehemiah, we have the political aspect of the return of the people. So the idea of separation in church and state is in not what Thomas Jefferson, what is implied today. In fact, if you're a citizen, you are a dual citizen. But Ezra, as we saw, was a fine representative of the priest and the scribe. Nehemiah is a noble representation of the businessman. All right? Nehemiah had a powerful position in the court of the Persian king named Artaxerxes. But Nehemiah's heart was with God's people and God's program back in Jerusalem, some 800 miles away. Chronologically, though Nehemiah is in the middle of your Bible, chronologically, Nehemiah is the last of the historical books. In other words, we will go no farther in the history of these people in the Old Testament than right here in the book of Nehemiah. Ezra picks up his story about 70 years uh, after the book of 2 Chronicles, which he was the author of. That 70 years of captivity is over, and the people are allowed to return, but really only a small remnant return to Israel. The return of Ezra's group, since we've been through that book, took place about 50 years after the first group returned under, remember his name, Zerubbabel? He was the first leader. Then Nehemiah returns about 15 years later after Ezra. So that shows you kind of the stage of Israel's return after their captivity in Babylon, and now they're under the Persian Empire. And if you're into prophecy, some of you may be, many are not, but if you are, if you've ever heard of the 70 weeks of Daniel, a week equals seven years, the 70 weeks of Daniel begins right here in Nehemiah. Jot this verse down if you're into prophecy. Daniel 9.25. I'll show you why that's important. The decree of the Persian king Cyrus. He was a pagan king. The, uh, Isaiah talked about him a century before he'd be born. Daniel led him to the Lord. And so, again, I ask, do we pray for our politicians to be led to the Lord? There's a big emphasis on politics uh, in this book. But anyway, the decree of King Cyrus allowed the Jews to return around 536 B.C. Ezra said that. And so now the decree of the Persian king Artaxerxes was given around 445 B.C. That's during the 20th year of his reign, and that's the first 70 weeks of Daniel. The whole testament closes at technically 397 or around 400 B.C. In other words, 400 years before Christ would come on planet Earth, the Old Testament closes out. All right? So anyway... In other words, why is this important? If you were a Jew, God gave all of these things, the very specific. So in other words, at the time when Jesus came to earth as a baby, they had no excuse. They had all these prophecies. They knew when it would line up, and the scribes threw it all out. It was all given to them, one by one. God wanted to make sure they would not miss when the Messiah would come to earth. But they ignored it, and they thought, well, he can't be born there. That can't be our king. So Daniel spelled it out as the prophets did. Those people should have been ready for him. But I wonder, how many of us are ready for the second coming of Jesus? Are we looking for that when you think about it? Anyway, God put it down in so much detail, they should not have missed it. Now, Ezra was a priest, so we saw the book through his eyes. Nehemiah was, is a layman, or was a layman, so we're going to see the book through his eyes. But think about this. God warned these people. Think how patient God is. For 500 years, God warned them about the travesty of turning to idolatry, but with no avail. So finally, God had to send these people into captivity so that they would learn there's only one true God to worship. Write down this word, Babylon. You see that word in Genesis? You see it in Revelation. Babylon is the home and mother of all idolatry. And that's why God said the original one would never be rebuilt. They'll rebuild it, but not on that same location. So why was it 70 years that they were in captivity? That was the number of Sabbaths that they neglected. 
so that people would learn the lesson and then God would allow them to return. But there was only three groups that came back and they were really small groups. And right, this you ought to jot this down. I'm trying to give you things that are easy to remember. Zerubbabel, you, know, you can put Zeb, Z-E-B if you want. He led the first group. He is the prince. That is the political side. Ezra led the second group. He is the priest, all right? That is the religious side. Nehemiah led the final group. He is the politician. Or we can actually say he is indeed the layman, but I'm going to repeat that. Zerubbabel led the first group. He's the prince. Ezra led the next group. He's the priest. And Nehemiah led the final group. He is the politician. So in other words, the prince and the priest failed to rebuild the walls and cleanse the temple. But listen, it was not their fault as an individual. It was the people. The failure was not their part. So God raised up Nehemiah to be a leader to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. Here's a simple outline. Jot this down. It's very easy. The book is very easy. The first seven chapters, one to seven, here's the theme. The rebuilding of the walls. That's easy to remember, right? Nehemiah 1 to 7, the theme is the rebuilding of the walls. The last chapters, 8 to 14, is this theme, the reform of the people. So that's easy to remember, isn't it? The first half is the rebuilding of the walls and all the challenges, and the second half is the reform of the people, which I will keep bringing this up. How important is it that our border is protected? Is that an issue? How about people coming over? I said, see, Ezra talked about this too. A lot of issues that we will actually be thinking about, voting on, putting people in positions that will make decisions about these very things. The conflict going on with Israel, etc. These are issues that keep resurfacing. Now, let's read the book of Nehemiah. I'm going to read the first part and give some comments on it. All right. The, the words of Nehemiah, the son of Hekeliah. Now, it happened in the month... Shizwa, and that is the, that's one of the months. It's very important to come back up again. But I want to jump down to verse 2. Here's the key guy. Nehemiah in verse 2. That Hananiah, one of my brothers, and I think he's talking about his Jewish brothers. One of my brothers and some men from Judah came. And I asked them concerning the Jews who had escaped and survived the captivity and about Jerusalem. And they said to me, the remnant there in the providence who survived the captivity are in great distress and reproach. And the wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates are burned with fire. Now it came about when I heard these words, I sat down and wept and mourned for days and I was fasting and praying before the God of heaven. And I want to stop there and make some comments. First of all, Hananiah, one of the Jewish guys, came, and they give this report to Nehemiah. Nehemiah did not return with the other groups. Why was that? Because he had a very important role for the king, and we'll mention it in a moment. But Nehemiah was moved by this message. He was compassionate. He had a great concern. It became very personal for Nehemiah. So he fasts and he prays. He was not indifferent to the cause, nor was he a critic of the people's failures. And I wonder today, for those who criticize things, are they really concerned? Nehemiah was born in captivity. He was probably a little boy during the years of the Babylonian captivity. Some didn't return, some did. There's nothing critical about that in Scripture. Some people stayed, others went back. It wasn't a big deal between the groups, but I'm quoting now uh, J. Vernon McGee. He says, in the old days, the preacher was respected. That is not so today. That's true. You could say the same thing with the politician, the professor, the policeman. I could go on. They're not respected today like they once were. Now, if you have the King James, I'm reading verse 5. You have the word terrible. It's really not an accurate word, what we'd say today. It's really the word awesome. Now, I'm going to start reading his prayer. And I said, I beseech thee, O Lord God of heaven, the great and awesome God who preserves the covenant and loving kindness for those who love him and keep his commandments. Let thine ear 
Now be attentive, and thine eyes open to the, hear the prayer of thy servant, which I am praying before thee now, day and night, on behalf of the sons of Israel, thy servants, confessing the sins of the sons of Israel, which we have sinned against thee, I and my father's house of sin. We have acted very corruptly against thee, and have not kept thy commandments, nor thy statutes, nor the ordinances which thou didst command thy servant Moses. Remember the word which thou didst command thy servant Moses, saying, If you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the peoples. But if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them, though those of you who have been scattered were in the most remote part, remote part of the heavens, I will gather them from there and will bring them to the place where I have chosen to cause my name to dwell. And they are thy servants and thy people whom thou didst redeem by thy great power and by thy strong hand. O Lord, I beseech thee, may thine ear be attentive to the prayer of thy servant and the prayer of thy servants who delight to revere thy name and make thy servant successful today and grant him compassion before this man. Now I was a cupbearer to the king. A couple of things, my own observations, I hope jumps out at you if you look back at verse 5. A common expression of prayer in the Old Testament was to call the God, the God of heaven, which means he's sovereign, he's in control. He's in control of all that's going on. Nehemiah needed to remind himself of that, and he is the God who keeps his word. Nehemiah says, you are the God that made the covenant, you keep it, you're faithful, you're loving. And he says, let your ear and your eye be attentive. In other words, God, I want you to hear what I'm saying, and I want, you, I want your eye to guide and watch what is going on. And he does. Notice Nehemiah says in verse 7, he includes the people's sin and his own personal sin. Here's something else you ought to jot down that just popped in my head, and you've probably seen this before. Write down in... Uh, linear line, A-C-T-S. That's the word acts. Have you ever heard this before? This is a good way to pray. In other words, you begin with adoration of God. Uh, the C would be confession. The T stands for thanksgiving. And the S stands for supplication. It's an easy way to think about a, a prayer, uh, how to pray. In other words, adoration. You start off by praising God, not bemoaning all your problems. Start with praising God and end your prayer with praising God. But C would be confession, confession of sin. If not for your own, for the land, the people. Other uh, T would be thanksgiving. That should always be included in our prayers and certainly supplication. And I noticed that God, he says in verse 8, I want you to remember your word. You know why he could say that? God, I hope you're remembering your word. Nehemiah knew the word. If you want God, you're reminding God of his word. I hope that you know what you're telling God. And then he says at the end, make us successful. There's nothing wrong with asking to be successful in what you do. Because that's indeed the way that Nehemiah um, prayed. So going back to what he was moved by the message, Nehemiah includes himself and the people. He takes a position of identifying with the people. He would constantly do that. He was concerned about the people. He fasted and he wept. And again, I'm quoting McGee. There are times for casual or criticism. But if things are not a concern to you and things do not break your heart, then leave criticism alone. If the message doesn't move you, then there's not a place of criticism that should come from you. In other words, Nehemiah was moved by the message. There's a lot of critics out there, but they're not moved by the message. He was. He wasn't some self-serving, pharisaical onlooker. But he calls attention to the covenant, and he calls attention to God. And he asked the king to give him success. He asked for mercy in the presence of the king. He wanted, and he was willing to be used of God. That's what God is looking for. Anybody that wants to be used of God and is willing to be used of God... God's going to use you in his work. But he wasn't running ahead of God. He's making himself available. The king would have to grant Nehemiah permission to indeed return. And I'm going to quote something here that I thought was very, very interesting when you're looking at thinking about broken lives and um, things of such nature. I was thinking about um, this in history. 
Back in the 16th century, you've heard of the reformer Martin Luther. He once said, God created the world out of nothing. And when I realize that I am nothing, then perhaps God can create something out of me too. Suppose you were to walk through the doors of any church on any given Sunday and ask this question, what kind of person does God use? What do you think would be the answer? A lot of people say, well, people with special gifts or extraordinary abilities, uniquely gifted people, but not regular folks like me. Oh, but God does. He certainly does. You are valuable in his eyes. Indeed, uh, more than you know. Indeed, more than you know. So um, God repairs and restores those that have broken lives. And think about this for your own life personally. Is there something in your life in need of repair? Is there something in your life in need of being rebuilt? That's the business that God is in, is repairing broken lives and rebuilding. Because the enemy will say, will tell you, well, if only, if only, if only I could go back. No, get that out and say, why not? Why not right now? I don't know how many of you I had to, I, I, I guess I didn't say endure, but it, when I was a child, we had to learn the nursery rhymes in music. So has anybody ever learned old nursery rhymes, the mother goose things? There's theme parks. You know, somebody asked me the other day, have I ever been to, to Bush Gardens? And I said, yes, but it's been many, many years ago. But I, I said, one of the things I liked about it was the country theme of Bush Gardens. We, we know Disney has their theme parks. And I know other people that have never been to a theme park, but their thing is the country, county, and state fair. I know people that have shown goats and horses and cows, and they spent half the year getting their animals ready to show them. And it's quite an ordeal to get the prized uh, animal, but they put a lot of work into that. But I know there's at least one um, kind of a theme park. It's more of a park up north that's dedicated to Mother Goose. And uh, I don't know if you ever, here's one that I wanted to give the true story. Have you ever heard this little, little nursery rhyme? Little Jack Horner sat in a corner eating a Christmas pie. He put in his thumb and pulled out a plum and said, what a good boy am I. Have you ever heard the true story behind this? Let me give you the true story about Jack Horner. He was actually an employee of Richard Wedding, who was the last church leader or abbot of the Glastonbury Cathedral in England. When King Henry VIII was taking over the church property or all the church property he could get his hands on, the abbot sent Jack Horner to, uh, to London with a Christmas gift for the king. It was a delicious looking pie. However, buried beneath the crust was anything but fruit. Inside were hidden the deeds of 12 prestigious estates. On the way to deliver the pie, knowing that the abbot was gonna transfer these estates to the king, Jack Horner opened the pie and took out one of the deeds for himself. He chose the manor of Mel's, which was quite a plum piece of property. A number of years later, the same Jack Horner betrayed the same abbot by sitting on a jury that convinced him of embezzlement and then had him executed. That conveniently erased any possibility of the abbot telling the truth about King Henry and Jack Horner's estates. In other words, this guy stole some property. Then he betrayed his best friend and had him executed. So that's quite a different story with little Jack Horner sat in the, uh, little Jack Horner sat in the corner eating a Christmas pie. He pulled in his thumb and pulled out a plum and said, what a good boy am I. I don't think he was a very good boy, but you get a whole different meaning behind that little nursery rhyme, right? Or this one we all know, Humpty Dumpty sat on a wall. Humpty Dumpty had a great fall and all the king's horses and all the king's men could not put Humpty Dumpty together again. What was that about? That first appeared in 1803 in print, and um, Humpty Dumpty, we know, was an egg, which explains well, if you have an egg and falls off the wall, it's going to break apart. But what was the real meaning behind it? We know eggs don't sit on walls, but uh, what exactly was the, the, the egg represent? The original, for the original rhyme maker, Humpty Dumpty was intended to be a symbol of the origin of life and the world of humanity. It was designed to lament the fact that humanity had fallen and was broken and not even the most powerful people in the earth, the king himself, his army or his wise men were able to put the broken pieces of life together again. And one contemporary author said, that's the world we live in. 
It specializes in producing broken people. And once broken, we discover that no power on earth can put us back together again. But that's not so. God can put us back together again. God isn't a specialist in repairing broken things and healing you and restoring or rebuilding in your life what indeed has been torn down. So I do hope that you remember that. And again, um, Nehemiah was a cupbearer. That was a dangerous position because you were the most trusted person because oftentimes if you wanted to get to the king, you would try to poison the king. And oftentimes you'd try to poison the king through his cup of wine or through his food. And so Nehemiah, you talk about having a secret service job, he had one. And so if you, so he was, he was the trust, the most trusted man in all the kingdom. But the enemies tried to bribe Nehemiah. Look, we'll give you a greater position. We'll give you power if you just join him with us and, and get rid of him. And assassinations were um, almost a commonplace in that sense. And there's two other biblical accounts you've probably heard of. In the book of Esther, Mordecai overheard the plans of an assassination attempt to kill the king, and he informed Esther. Genesis 40 says there was a time in Joseph's life when he was placed in the dungeon where he was there for years. Eventually, Pharaoh's baker and cup maker uh, were down there thrown in, in, with an investigation going on to discover which one of those was guilty of trying to assassinate and poison Pharaoh. Well, you recall that the baker was found guilty and later executed. The baker, the cupbearer was set free, but Joseph said, now would you remember me when you go before Pharaoh? And he forgot all about him. But God didn't forget about Joseph. So in other words, if you were Nehemiah, you had a dangerous job being the cupbearer um, of the king. So the king, that was the most trusted position. So in other words, the king trusted Nehemiah more than anybody else in the kingdom. And so that, and that also not only involved you know, protecting the king, but we know from other records he would have been a keeper of the signet ring in charge of administration. So he was a very important person. He was probably started out very ordinary, but he was special. And if you're into, if you're into art, I thought this was interesting too. That palace was actually like, it was in Susa. That would have been like the winter resort. You ever have a winter resort or summer resort where you go? That was the winter resort for the king living in Persia. And the palace and grounds were 5,000 acres, and there were gems and gold that were all part of the architecture. Murals of bulls and wings were excavated that showed, goes back to the time of Nehemiah, proving that the Bible indeed is true. So going back to the book, and I want to again reflect on what Nehemiah was asking. He's asking to go forward with the plans to help these Jews. Now, take out the outline. I'm going to get to it in a moment. But a couple of other points I want to bring out that we'll look at. Chapter 2, I'm just going to give you an overview. We're going to see that the king did give him permission to return. That's when the 70 years of Daniel's prophecy begin. But he had a political job. As I said, he tasted the wine before it came to the king. If the, if the cup was poisoned, down would go Nehemiah first. It's a dangerous job. He would become an advisor, and that's why he did not return with the people to, the, to Jerusalem. And yet, he was so burdened that he came before the king in sadness. You did not go before the king being sad or having a sad countenance. That could end your life right there. That would be your last day of sorrow. There are two people that went before the king in sorrow. One of them was Nehemiah. Quiz, who was the other one? Esther, by the way, guess who is the queen that is sitting on the throne here? It is Esther when she's older. So we're gonna, we'll look at later how influential Esther was when she was a young lady. Here she is an older lady, and her son-in-law is the king. So Esther is also prominent in encouraging the king to let Nehemiah go back. What a wonderful lady this is. Indeed, she was. Her name means star, and certainly Esther. And that means in her younger life and in her older life, she was used. So you can't say, well, I'm too old to be used of God. Not so. 
God used her both when she was young and when she was older. So they hoped that he would go, but they also hoped that he would return. He had a very important job there in Susa, the capital of Persia. So Ezra, when he went back, he didn't have a whole lot of support. When Nehemiah was granted, he, he took up the, half the Persian army with him when he went back to Jerusalem. And when Nehemiah arrives, you know, he didn't tell anybody what God had put in his heart. He goes around and he investigates the situation. He wants God to work with them. And then he inspects everything. And then he tells the officials of the city what God has laid on his heart. We need to rebuild the walls for our protection, for our defense, and for a testimony to God so that we will no longer be a reproach. He calls with the meeting with the officials of the city, and he says, let's do it. God is with us. He was a God-inspired leader. He was motivated to work and to rebuild the walls, and yet he was a modest leader. He always identified with the people. And I wonder how many politicians today are really going to step out of the limelight and really work for the people. They say that, but how many of them in the grand scheme of things really do that? Oh, I pray that God would raise up men and women that would indeed be that because he would eventually become the governor. Now, Nehemiah always draws attention back to God throughout the whole book. He wasn't perfect. I don't even think he's perfect in all of his actions in the book. But he says, the God of heaven will give us success. So what is it that needs to, re, to be rebuilt in your life? Let's go to the outline. I'm going to leave some parting thoughts with you, which I do really think is important, coming strictly from chapter 1 of Nehemiah. But again, uh, I'm going to quote Stephen Davey before I have you fill in the blanks. That's some final thoughts here. Think about this. He was mourning and he was fasting and praying. And as we're going to learn, not, can you think about praying for four hours? Well, probably none of us have done that at one time. How about four days? Our four weeks. Nehemiah fasted and prayed, I'm sure he ate in between, for four months. That's how big of a burden this was to him. I did a play once on reformers, and I had several of them. And one of them was John Knox, and I played John Knox because I had this, we had these magazines at the time that were historical. We actually had the actual letters that John Knox wrote. I enjoyed playing because I thought we actually resurrected Queen Elizabeth out of history because the lady that played her, man, she was a spitting image of her, and it was really enjoyable. But we also had Queen Mary. She was known in history as Bloody Mary. She only reigned for five years, but she put as many Protestants to death as she could. She hated the Protestants, and she hated the Protestant Reformation. But she said this, I fear the prayers of John Knox more than anything else on earth, because he would pray in her gardens enough for her to hear, Oh God, give me Scotland or I die. But you think about Nehemiah. He had every reason not to be concerned about going back to Jerusalem, he was born in captivity. He had never been there. He never worshipped at the temple. He had a great career in Persia that he would give up. He was at the king's hand every day. Why would he pray in a sense, give me Jerusalem or I die? Why would he go to a broken down city 800 miles away to a people he did not know and a problem he did not create? Because he was burdened for the glory of God. That's why. If you, he says this, Stephen, if you want the maximum attention of God, first give your maximum attention to God. Do you want God to be available to you? How available are you to him? <laughs> Nehemiah had an overwhelming concern for these people in distress. He had a, a, a conviction that God can do this, and he had confidence in compliance and the will of God. Now in your outline, here's what I want you to add. This is my thoughts from Nehemiah chapter 1. Ask God to give you right in a passion for what really matters in life. In other words, listen, listen, what is lasting, what is going to make a difference in your life and for others. That's what's important. A passion for what matters in life, what is lasting and what will make the most difference in your life 
and for others. Most of us are given to superficial things. And I thought about this. for uh, This was a conviction to me. I read this uh, the other day in the Psalm 40. Many are your works, O Lord. And I thought to myself, how many times do we focus on our own works? Either we're relishing in the glory of our own works or we're hitting ourselves with all the mistakes and failures of our works. And I thought to myself, what God wants is to think about his works. Many are your works, O Lord, but we tend to focus on our work. And a lot, a lot of us like to be in a position of power. You know, Gideon was a really, he was a tough guy to get into God, God to get him to work. But finally they said, Gideon, let's make you king. Gideon said, I will not be king over you. The Lord God will be king over you. He needs to be king of your life. A passion for what really matters. Secondly, a purpose for your work. Ask God to give you a purpose for your work and your gifts, listen, and your availability and your time. We all have the same 24-hour day. A purpose for your work, your gifts, your availability, and your time. And I think we probably have to ask for all of us. What in our life is, where, where are we wasting time? Probably a lot of that goes on. Third, ask God to give you a plan for your prayer life. Ask God to give you a plan for your prayer life. Be a person devoted to God. Finally, this is all from Nehemiah 1. Ask God to give you a pursuit of learning the Bible. You say, I don't know very much of it. Just start right where you are. Because if you think, I don't understand the Bible, you'll never get started. It's like a lady that, you know, got pregnant. Well, there's never a right, yes, there's never a right time. It's God's time. I can't go back to school. This, we can always make excuses. So sometimes you have to wait on God's timing. But for the Bible, the best time to start is today. Ask God to give you a pursuit for learning the Bible. Just read it. And ask the Lord right in to give you understanding so that you can remember it and apply it with specifics in your life. Nehemiah said, oh God, remember your word, because Nehemiah knew the word. That's probably the most important part is that last one. Ask God to give you a pursuit of learning the Bible. Ask the Lord to give you an understanding so that you can remember it and apply it with specifics in your life. You know, God is a specialist in rebuilding what is broken in your life, in healing you where you need healing, and restoring and rebuilding. You probably saw in there that church that was burned down. Uh, George's Aunt Margie used to go to that church, Presbyterian church. They got to start all over, brick by brick. And sometimes that's where you have to start. Just, you know, Carlisle, I just thought of this off the top of my mind. I'll close with this. He was writing a whole you know, Treaty, he was a great author, and he was writing, he spent months and months and months on it. And one day when he was out, the maid came in and thought it was garbage and threw it all in the fire. <laughs> and he was so despondent, he was about ready to give up because he put I mean, almost a year's worth of work into that. And he looked out the window and he saw bricklayers doing one brick at a time. And he said, the Lord, you want me to start back over just one day at a time, one brick at a time. Maybe for some of you, that's where you have to start. One hour at a time, one day at a time, one treatment at a time, whatever it might be.